record-breaking 82 Muslim electoral victories, including 38 state legislative wins. U.S. seizes $3.36 billion Bitcoin connected to wire fraud and dark web. 636 fossil fuel lobbyists swarm COP27 climate talks. Pakistan and Bangladesh among the most climate-impacted countries. UN Human Rights Commission opens hearing on occupied Palestinian territory. 80% of 777 pellet victims in Indian-held Kashmir have partial vision loss, study. From our Toronto studios, this is the Muslim News on Muslim Network TV. Assalamu alaikum, I'm Samia Sayed. Our top story tonight, 82 American Muslims won in Tuesday's U.S. midterm election. As well, 21 incumbent state legislators who were up for re-election also won. They will be joined by 16 new members, increasing the total number of Muslim state lawmakers nationwide to 43. All three Muslim con congresspersons, Ilhan Omar, Rashida Talib, and Andre Carson, were also re-elected. Since control of this Senate may be once again decided in Georgia, Americans will not know who will be in charge of it until December. But if any party wins two more seats before that, it may end the long wait. Republicans have captured at least 210 House seats, Edison Research projected. They are eight short of the 218 needed to control the House. Voters in Alabama, Tennessee, Oregon, and Vermont approved ballot measures on Tuesday that would bar forced labor as punishment for those convicted of crimes in those states. The move is an effort to close a slavery loophole contained in many state constitutions as well as within the U.S. Constitution's 13th Amendment. Speaking after the passage of Measure 112 in his state of Oregon, Democratic Senator Jeff Merkley said there should be no exceptions to a ban on slavery. He called for all Americans to come together and say that it must be struck from the U.S. Constitution. Former U.S. Vice President Mike Pence published an excerpt from his upcoming book as a column in the Wall Street Journal. He recalls a conversation with the former president about overturning election results. Ex-President Trump told him, you're too honest and hundreds of thousands are going to hate your guts. People are going to think you're stupid. On January 11th, Pence remembered talking to Trump, confessing that seeing those people tearing up the Capitol infuriated me. He went on to tell Trump to his face that what happened on January 6th was horrific and wrong. Pence said that he had told Trump he was praying for him. In response, Trump said, don't bother. The U.S. government seized $3.36 billion worth of Bitcoin connected to a wire fraud on the dark web a decade ago, the Justice Department announced Monday. James Jong pleaded guilty on Friday for unlawfully obtaining over 50,000 Bitcoin from the Silk Road dark web internet marketplace. Silk Road Marketplace is an online darknet black market. It was shut down by the FBI in 2013. The law enforcement agency seized more than 50,000 Bitcoin, which were then valued at over $3.6 billion in November last year. However, as of Monday, that amount is worth a little over $1 billion, since the global crypto market has considerably shrunk since last year. A story on 636 fossil fuel lobbyists swarming COP27 climate talks comes with details after the break. So stay tuned and we will be right back after these messages. Despite the development of a COVID-19 vaccine, millions around the world will not have access. We need a vaccine that's free and available to everyone, everywhere. It's time for a people's vaccine. If I could be you, and you could be me for just one hour. If we could find a way 
to get inside each other's minds. Walk a mile in my shoes. Walk a mile in my shoes. Well, before you abuse, criticize and accuse. Walk a mile in my shoes. There are 16 million children struggling with hunger in America. That's one in five daughters, sons, neighbors, and classmates who don't know where their next meal is coming from. Yet billions of pounds of good food go to waste every year. It's time we do something about it. Feeding America is a nationwide network of food banks that helps provide meals to millions of kids and families in need. Visit feedingamerica.org to help them feed even more. Together, we can solve hunger. Together, we're Feeding America. Assalamu alaikum. This is Imam Malik Mujahid in Chicago. Just like you, I was moved by that Allahu Akbar lady. She stood her ground, fearful of none, for her hijab and for her education. Sisters and brothers, Indian Muslims are facing a genocide. India does not care for Muslim protesting, but it does care for the world opinion. Therefore, we must push the United Nations. The UN has a responsibility to protect. They must prevent genocide. Please sign this UN petition now. Get others to sign. It will help. Trust me, it will help. We need one million signatures, brothers and sisters. Please sign now. Welcome back. The COP27 climate talks in Egypt have been billed as an opportunity for countries to showcase unity against the existential threat of climate change. However, an analysis released Thursday shows there are 636 fossil fuel lobbyists attending the conference. It is heightening concerns that industry influence will water down any agreements reached at the event. The analysis was carried out by Corporate Accountability, Corporate Europe Observatory, and Global Witness. The German Watch Global Climate Risk Index has announced the top 10 countries most impacted by the worsening global climate emergency. At the top of the list are Puerto Rico, Burma, and Haiti. Pakistan and Bangladesh are also listed among the top 10 worst impacted countries. Other nations include the Philippines, Mozambique, the Bahamas, Thailand, and Nepal. A former UN human rights chief on Monday opened a four-day independent international commission of inquiry on the occupied Palestinian territory, including East Jerusalem and Israel. The inquiry is a series of public hearings from victims and survivors of Israeli atrocities. It is being held at the headquarters of the UN Human Rights Council in Geneva. The commission established by the UN Human Rights Council in May 2021 will investigate all alleged violations of international humanitarian law. It will look into the root causes of recurrent tensions, instability, and protraction of the conflict. These include systematic discrimination and repression based on national, ethnic, racial, or religious identity. The commission reports to the Human Rights Council and the UN General Assembly on an annual basis. The Commission has already released two reports on the issue. Iran's army ground forces commander said on Wednesday that rioters would have no place in the Islamic Republic. Anti-government demonstrations erupted in September after the death of a Kurdish woman, Masa Amini. The protests quickly turned into a popular revolt with people ranging from students, doctors and lawyers to workers and athletes taking part. Amnesty International said security forces killed at least 66 people there on 30th September in Zahedan, a Sunni majority city. Some of the worst unrest has been in areas home to minority ethnic groups with long standing grievances against the state, including the Sistan, Baluchistan, and Kurdish regions. British forces have paid compensation for the deaths of 64 children in Afghanistan. This is four times higher than the 16 child deaths publicly acknowledged by the Ministry of Defense, according to a new report. 
The average age of a child killed was six years old, and airstrikes were the most common cause of death listed. However, the majority of the 881 fatality claims brought by Afghans were rejected since documentation like birth certificates did not exist. Action on Armed Violence, a United Kingdom-based charity, found that the British government paid on average $1,894 in compensation for each person killed. Euler community leaders in Canada have asked Prime Minister Justin Trudeau why his administration is not recognizing genocide in East Turkestan. This is the region the Chinese government calls Xinjiang. Trudeau met with about 10 community leaders on Monday in Montreal to discuss a wide range of topics related to East Turkestan. The meeting's organizer was lawmaker Samir Zuberi. In June, Zuberi introduced a motion in Parliament to help Uyghurs fleeing ongoing genocide in China by expediting entry for 10,000 Uyghurs. Parliament voted 258 to 0 in support of the measure last month, echoing the February 2021 motion to recognize the situation in East Turkestan as genocide, which passed 266 to 0. A huge majority of Kashmiris who received eye injuries due to India using gun pellets on them have suffered vision loss. About 80% of them have vision limited to counting fingers, according to a review research paper on 777 eye operations carried out during this period. The review strongly advised against the use of pellet guns on civilians. It said the injuries imposed a significant physical, emotional, and socioeconomic burden on society and the patient. Coming up next after the break is our in-depth analysis segment, so stay tuned and we will be right back after these messages. Despite the development of a COVID-19 vaccine, millions around the world will not have access. We need a vaccine that's free and available to everyone, everywhere. It's time for a people's vaccine. Dad, they took over my bedroom. Come on, come on. Okay, Dad. One, two, three. Ah! Dad! You saved me. Dad? Are you okay? I'm fine, dear. you now and AARP is here to help. Find the care guides you need at aarp.org caregiving. Welcome back. To talk about the recent U.S. midterm elections, let's go to Imam Abdul Malik Mujahid. Over to you, Imam Mujahid. Thank you, Samia. Elections are over, but results are not over yet. It, uh, election day is turning into election week, but it is pretty clear if nobody gets the majority in Senate, we might have election month uh, as the uh, you know runoff elections takes place in Georgia to determine who controls the Senate. Uh, how Muslims are doing? Uh, there's enthusiasm. I see Muslims voting and I saw uh, our mosque even was a polling station. So Muslim participation is increasing, but how much is it and what are the results? Are Muslims running for office? To discuss all of that, we have someone who keeps an eye on this, Muhammad Mizori. Assalamu alaikum. Welcome to Muslim Network TV. Alaikum assalam. Thank you for having me. Mohammad Mazuri is an organizer and political communication professional. He joined Jetpack team in 2019 to ensure fair representation of American Muslims in politics. 
So share with us, uh, Mohammed Mizori, that uh, what are the findings uh, of your organization about Muslim participation uh, in terms of uh, contesting an election and winning or losing? Sure. So uh, we've been tracking the electoral progress of Muslim candidates going back to 2017, 2018. Our first report called uh, Breaking Barriers came out, or Changemakers, sorry, came out in 2018. Uh, what we're seeing is that Muslims are running for office in record numbers almost every single cycle. This year, for instance, we have we tracked over 145 people on election night, uh, ranging from you know Congress all the way down to local um, local officials, local races across the country, and uh, we so that's the highest number of people on a general election ballot from our community that we've ever we, we've ever seen. And then we also saw record numbers so far of people who got elected. I mean, when we put out the report, for instance, uh, yesterday, we had um, we had 82 people declaring a victory and, you know, having those final results that the previous number from 2020 was 71. So that's an, that's a new record since since then, since yesterday, since we put out that release, we can confirm at least five other people. So we're we're looking at almost getting to 90 uh, people elected on general, you know, on Tuesday, which is the highest number of elected officials that we've had elected, uh, you know, in a general election since we started this tracking. And it's almost 19 more than the 71, the record from 2020. So, and you're right. Yeah, I think, um, I think it's possible that we, you know, w there will be more trickling in because you said, you know, more results, obviously. Um, we'll, we'll figure out what comes in from California and some of these Western uh, some of these Western states uh, where the counting, you know, they're still counting mail-in ballots and, uh, and, uh, and otherwise. So you mentioned you were tracking um, 150 seats, more or less. Uh, how do you come to know that these are the seats to be tracked? That there may be more seats which you are not tracking at this moment. So we go through um, election websites uh, from in every state and then go down, you know, to... Um, to local city clerks and county clerks to in, in, in their websites to see who's on the ballot. And then if we, you know, we, we recognize Muslim names um, or, you know, sometimes, I, and we then look up these names to get verification that they're Muslim. If we have actual verification that someone identifies as such, and it's, um, then we put them in our list and, and track them. If we can't get that verification, we usually reach out. And if we can't hear, we don't hear back from them. Uh, obviously, for whatever reason, you know, we won't say. So the number could be higher by a little bit. Every year we put out a report, um, you know, we get maybe up to 10 people who say, I saw this thing, I'm also Muslim. Um, and I suspect we're going to see the same again. But usually we've been very, very close to the actual number because we, we, we do a lot of research going down to the local level to make sure we know, we know who's on the ballot uh, and to look at actual sample ballots wherever we can find them for school committees, you know, local race, all kinds of local races. Uh, we don't just like rely on newspaper clippings or anything like that. We actually check out uh, official data from state and local officials. Okay, so as compared to two years ago, you have 19 more people uh, are winning. Mm -hmm. how, do, how do you compare uh, election earlier than that? The, the previous high number before 71, I think, was 57, I believe, which was from 20, 20, 2018 or 2019. I, I, I unfortunately don't remember exactly. So the number is trending upwards every single year. Obviously, there will be um, election years where there are just fewer elections in general. Like next year, most likely we'll have fewer elections all over the country. And that's why you might have a, a dip in the number. But in terms of like like years, uh, we, we keep seeing uh, every like year, the trend uh, is, is upwards in terms of people running, people succeeding in, in primaries. And just so we are clear, um, the number we attract people this year, the record number of people on the general election ballot is from, is from general election only. There are many more people who ran in primaries as well uh, who were not on this, in this report. Um, so this is a, it, it's a big number. And again, like it keeps trending upwards. And going back to how the community is faring in general, I would say it's not just that the whole number is, is huge, it's that we're seeing different kinds of people running for different kinds of seats. We're, you know, you, you look at our candidates, we have a lot of young people running, which is, a, which is very encouraging. Our, it, the people running showcase our community's, you know, diversity in terms of, of gender, but also, you know, ba ethnic backgrounds and, and otherwise. And so it's, it's a very interesting thing to see the community running in such sustainable numbers, in such high numbers, 
but also the truly like the thing that is the most impressive from Tuesday is that we elected 16 state lawmakers first time, like for the first time. So we had 29 state elected people to state legislatures um, before Tuesday. Uh, two of those 29 didn't run for re-election. So, so we still have the other ones ran. Not everyone was on the ballot, but those who were on the ballot was 22 of them and they all won re-election. And in, in addition to those 22 who ran and the, the, the other five who are still, you know, uh, who are up next year and the year after that, uh, 16 new people won their seats. And we made history with two more Muslim, American Muslims running for office and winning in Ohio for state legislature, three in Maine, two more in Minnesota, three more in Georgia, two more in Texas. All those states now have Muslim state legislators. And that's, that's a massive statement from our community. Yes, and you did not mention Illinois. We have and, and two, two from Illinois. Illinois and two well. from Illinois. No, of course. Abdul Nasser Rashid and Nabila Sayed did, did remarkably well. And, you know, Nabila flipped the seat too. So it's just incredible to see truly like the work across the board. So in terms of the federal elections, the congressional elections and Senate, uh, so Mohammed Mehmet Oz was running uh, for Senate. Mm -hmm. He was defeated. I mean, uh, Pennsylvania metro area has more than 120 masjids. What was the response of Muslims? Because he, he is a Muslim, but he calls himself a spiritual Muslim and secular Muslim, and he was running for the Republican Party. Uh, how, how, how was the reaction of the Muslim community? Did he gain any Muslim votes there? I suspect he gained some for sure. Obviously, there there will always be people who will vote for people from our community who will vote for some people in our community. And obviously, there are Republican voters inside of the um, Muslim community as well. But my, my you know my sense is that for the most part, um, Muslim voters um, and Muslim you know, and you see it in our elected officials as well, is that we trend towards the Democratic Party um, because yes, identity for us is very important and we care deeply about someone being Muslim running for office and someone who's proud of, truly proud to be Muslim too and, and actually saying I'm a Muslim candidate, uh, which I don't think actually he's said. So it's hard for me to, you know, sort of like, I don't want to put words in people's mouth and say, you know, so-and-so is, is, is a religion or another, that's up to him. Um, but I think for us as a community, it's important that someone who runs is actually proud of that, that, you know, embraces it and doesn't sort of let people guess. Uh, and I think the other element of it is too, though, is, is what are your values as a candidate? Do you care about ending oppression for all people? Do you care about things like ending homelessness, about, you know, about fair, good education funding for all people? Like those are real Muslim values. Um, as you know, like we're a very charitable community. We contribute to all these kinds of charities every single year to lift people out of poverty, to, to make sure that people have housing. And, and those are right now, those are things that are being championed by the Democratic Party, not so much by the Republican Party. So I think our voters at the end of the day, they care more about that than anything else. Uh, I think the majority of Muslim voters look at that and they, they would have probably voted again for the Democratic candidate in that race for that reason. And I think that's reflected also in Muslim organizations endorsing Fetterman um, over us because of these, you know, the, the policy differences between the candidates. In terms of uh, House representative, Muslim has just three House representatives. It has been the case for a while. Mm -hmm. Why no other Muslim is uh, winning the congressional seat? I think when when in twenty sixteen or in twenty seventeen, really as a reaction to to um, you know the the vitriol we saw from uh, the Republican presidential candidate at the time uh, against our community. Um, there was a reaction to run for Congress in, 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 in 2017 and 2018 and 2019, for sure. Um, and we saw a lot of people running for Congress immediately. But the truth is, it's very hard to run for Congress as your first seat. It's very, very difficult. It costs millions of dollars to win a seat like that. You need a lot of different kinds of support in order to actually reach the, the large number of voters. We're talking about, you know, districts that have uh, that are seven to nine hundred thousand people in them. And so to get to reach that, you know, the, the number of voters you need to win such an election, um, you need millions of dollars because you need to reach a large number of, of people. Um, I think what you see with the three we have in there, for instance, and before them, we had, you know, Attorney General Keith Ellison, who was, a, who was a member of Congress before that, the first Muslim ever. Those people all ran for local office first. They were state lawmakers. And so they built relationships as state lawmakers. 
They built, um, you know, name, like essentially name ID, name awareness in their own communities. So when the time came, when the congressional seat opened up in there, in both cases, um, you saw them being ready for that, for that seat and having support from their community, having endorsements that, that helped them get, you know, along the way. And, all, and, you know, and having relationships, frankly, that can help you raise money because that also matters. So it's, a, it, you, it's very rare to see someone go straight to Congress unless you can say, you know, they raised an incredible amount of money or something and had all this establishment support, essentially, because the establishment picked them to run. That's not going to happen that often with our community right now. But we will see now with, with about 48 members, state legislators, very often state legislators become members of Congress. Now that we have more and more of those, we, you'll see in the next 10 years, hopefully, inshallah, we'll see more people winning because they're ready for that next level, which is, which is Congress or state, you know, a state level position like Attorney General Ellison after Congress becoming you know, the Attorney General. So um, it, to get to that level, you need to build their building steps. You can't, it's very hard to go straight there. Well, thank you so much, Mohammed Missouri. Uh, and last question, what, what, does, what else does Jetpack does? So our, our main focus is to train people from our community um, on the tools they need essentially to run for office. So we, we go through the process with people on the leading practices um, that currently exist for campaign strategies for how to put together a successful campaign to increase their win probability. Um, but in addition to that, we do obviously also do other things such as um, lobby for specific legislation that, that impacts our community that we care about. Um, and, it, and we also try to make sure that we're, we have appointments and government positions because it's not just about electing people. It's also about making sure we have representation in, 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 in government in general and not all those positions are elected. Some of those are appointed. So, and we also mentor people who want to work in government behind the scenes, work on campaigns to make sure we can connect them, teach them the skills that they need and connect them to, to jobs in, in this field. Well, thank you so much, Mohamed Misery, for your time. Mohamed Misery is an organizer and works for Jetpack team. Thank you. Thank you so much. Back to you, Samia. Thank you so much. That's all from our Toronto studios tonight. Thank you so much for tuning in. You can find previous episodes and more on our YouTube or Facebook. For more content, keep watching Muslim Network TV or visit muslimnetwork.tv. Assalamu alaikum and good night.